Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. With me today are two guests, and they are both almost half my age, probably close to it. We are discussing millennial caregivers today, so I want to introduce to you Matthew and Lakeland. They are both with Home Instead. It's I will, I will let them tell you what they do. So thanks for joining me, guys. Thanks, Thanks so much. Yes. You're welcome. So first, just to get it out of the way, you guys b- both work for um, Home Instead. So tell me a little bit about that because I think I'm familiar with it, but just clue everybody in. Oh, we'd love to. Uh, and it, what's neat is Matt and I are coming to you from different parts of the country. Uh, home and Set Senior Care, we're an international home care organization. And I uh, work for our global headquarters based in Omaha, Nebraska. And I'll let Matt tell you where he's from in just a bit. But we provide care in the home. And we serve a lot of individuals living with dementia and other types of cognitive impairment. So uh, when we were invited to join you on this podcast, I was really excited. I've listened to some of your episodes. And uh, I just want to thank you, Jennifer, for bringing all these really important topics to family caregivers in a really um, approachable way through this podcast. So excited to be here. And Matt, I'll let you introduce yourself. So I work out of Waterford, Michigan. Um, What I do is I'm a client care manager. So I get to go into everyone's home um, and actually sit with the families um, and really get to know them and make sure that we're providing the best care possible at all times. That's awesome. I was not aware that Home Instead was international. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. It is. 13 countries as of now. Do you know all 13 off the top of your head? Oh, goodness. Now you're really <laughs> testing me. I know we're in. I, I could spout off a few. I know U.S. and Canada, uh, uh, several countries in Europe, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, uh, Singapore, and I'm probably missing a few, but those are kind of the big ones. And, uh, and so if you want a full list, I can get it to you later. <laughs> no, I'm just, I was just curious mostly. That's, um, Japan is interesting since culturally they're quite different than the United States and Canada and probably the UK. So just to dive in, because like I said before we started recording, we have like so much stuff we could talk about. We can be here all day, um, but I want people to be able to hear everything. So if we have to maybe do this again, we can. So what do you guys think is one of some of the biggest challenges that millennial caregivers face? See, I'm a Gen Xer, so I, I, I can tell you about my generation, but you guys tell me what, you know, what, fa- what faces uh, millennials for this, for caregiving? Wow, my brain is trying to glitch. <laughs> Well, I think that you you bring up a great first question. You know, what are some of the challenges for millennial caregivers? Uh, I know a lot of people listening to this podcast likely know what a caregiver is, but I think, Matt, you might agree with me. Our generation, we might not realize that a lot of us take on caregiving roles, uh, but we might just think of it as, you know, helping out uh, grandma or grandpa, or my mom's really the primary caregiver for grandma, but I'm helping out too. And and I think that makes a person a caregiver. So I think a challenge, uh, first and foremost, is just people identifying as a caregiver. Uh, but there are so many more millennial caregivers than we ever, I think, thought there was. Uh, A recent report came out, there's over 10 million millennial caregivers out there. Um, And, you know, millennials are in a phase of life where we are, uh, you know, just starting out in our careers. Maybe we just wrapped up graduate school or getting married, maybe starting a family or wanting to travel and uh, experience the world uh, pre-COVID. But so for many millennials, if they're taking on a caregiving role, those parts of their life are interrupted. Uh, Matt, do you have any other thoughts on some of the challenges that millennials are facing? No, I mean, overall, you covered most of it. Um, I mean, just trying to have a social life and normal life and even something as little as dating can be a big challenge um, for millennials who are also taking on the role as a caregiver. So I totally agree with everything you just said. The the interview I did with the other millennials was my daughter and a gal taking care of her grandmother. And we were going to do an episode on dating as a millennial caregiver, but uh, one of the problems with being a millennial caregiver, caregiver in general is 
lack of time. So it never happened. So well, I can't imagine. That say that because I do, I have seen a lot of millennials that where they are dating, they take on the caregiving role for one parent, but as a team, which is funny. That, so it's funny that you say it like that. Cause I've seen that a lot where yeah, as a couple, you kind of are a caregiver together. Yeah. She, the last time I chatted with her, I don't think there was any significant other in her life. And she must be 34 or 35 at this point. I'm trying to remember, you know, this was, I think, October of 2018. Ooh, time flies, especially, especially the, well, time flies and is dragging by these days. So um, <laughs> let's see. Are the dual responsibilities that you guys face, you know, caregiving and career, is that something that employers should address? I definitely have opinions on that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that, you know, if you look back at um, the support that employers give their employees, I think a really good example um, of employees stepping up is uh, when they're supporting young mothers or, you know, parents in the workplace. I think employers have done a really great job of, of you know, providing flexibility for those individuals. So now it's time for employers to step up for family caregivers, I think in that way, or we can use that as kind of a model. Um, and so I think employers definitely have great opportunity to uh, really work with these millennial caregivers. Uh, again, we talked about how a lot of times they're early on in their career, um, millennial caregivers, so they might be a little shy or apprehensive about approaching their employers about their caregiving situation, but I think it's really important to have that open dialogue and as the employer at all levels of management uh, to really make that part of the culture where you can come forth if you have a caregiving responsibility. Um, I think oftentimes, you know, when you have to go pick up your kids uh, from school, you're more willing to talk about that than having to take mom or dad uh, or an elderly loved one to a doctor's appointment. Uh, you know, there's just a little bit of stigma, I think, still there. So uh, companies can be offering things like flex time. You know, maybe if the millennial caregiver needs to help their loved one get up in the morning, uh, maybe they come in at 10 a.m. and they work until 6 p.m. Uh, just to make that, that caregiving uh, responsibility a, poss a possibility for that for that millennial or or maybe uh, employers enhance their EAP services you know for counseling or uh, care management case management type services um, at home and said a while back we developed a campaign called daughters in the workplace it's public education free resources uh, we know we named it daughters in the workplace because we know daughters are more likely to take on that role uh, but there are more and more males stepping into the caregiving role uh, and so we have a great website, daughtersintheworkplace.com, where we have tips for both the employer on how to make the workplace more caregiving friendly, but also tips for the employee on how to approach your employer, because this might not even be on their radar yet. Um, so uh, I, I really do think that there's a lot of work that can be done uh, in this arena. Um, but, but again, there's um, still a lot of work Sorry, a lot of work that can be done in this arena, uh, but I think it is promising. I think companies are waking up uh, to, to this idea. Um, there's even some larger employees like Deloitte, a big accounting firm. They offer paid time off for family caregiving. Um, so, you know, I think people are, uh, employers are becoming more flexible, but um, like, like supporting working parents, there's, there's more I think we can do for working family caregivers, especially those millennial caregivers who are young, uh, more um, just starting out in their careers or younger in their careers. It's interesting. I did a, an episode on um, caregiving and employment struggles and getting mm. employers to talk to me was challenging. <laughs> and one of the things I think, and this is, I, I'm kind of snickering a little bit in my head. Because one of, I think one of the reasons that employers are starting to wake up is that people at the, the advanced end of their career, the, the C-suite managers, the upper echelons, they're having to retire earlier, take more time off, yeah. and it leaves a vacuum of talent. And so I yeah. think if you take a step back and it's like, once again, Gen X gets ignored, but that's okay. We were used to it. <laughs> <laughs> if you've got... Um, baby boomers who are approaching retirement who have to retire abruptly or shift 
their schedules from full time to part time, and you've got millennials who are struggling with juggling 15 things at once every day because you know you're taking care of the boomers because there's just not enough of my generation to handle it all. You know, it's I can see corporations kind of getting slammed from both ends, and it's like, okay, there's not enough bodies to do what we need to do. So, good or bad, I think that that's the the those two generations on either end of the career cycle are going to really push employers to make changes. And I think, you know, one of the, I'm hoping one of the positive things with the COVID outbreak is that people realize that, you know, you can do a lot more remotely Mm -hmm. and maybe, you know, if mom, like I've talked to caregivers whose loved ones, it takes forever to get them out of bed and you don't rush them. I'm sure you guys know that Mm -hmm. you don't rush toddlers either. So it's, you know, it's like, it's, it kind of encompasses both sides of the, of the coin. You know, if you could do, do a meeting from home, like we're doing now via zoom, you know, it just, I think technology and flexibility are two important tools that Mm -hmm. employees and employers should utilize to make, you know, just to, to take care of everybody in our world, because I think that's really super important. So you guys said, let me ask Matt this one because he's sitting <laughs> over there in the corner quietly. <laughs> um, how can millennials avoid feeling isolated when their responsibilities are drastically different than their peers? That's got to be a really huge challenge. Okay. Um, well, I actually have a little story about that one. Perfect. So, I asked um, the right person. <laughs> so when my grandma passed away, my grandpa who has diabetes um, really sort of stopped taking care of himself. Um, I, he, it was right about the time where Burger King started making hot dogs, which hmm. I didn't even only know that because he started eating Burger King hot dogs every day as a diabetic. Ooh, <laughs> which for a non-diabetic. <laughs> so, and then after grandma passed, he started to physically decline. Um, but he is a tough, tough old man who does not like help at all. That sounds um, like my dad was. <laughs> Even though both of his daughters are or work for a company that takes care of seniors in their homes, he wanted nothing to do with help. Um, so then I started going over and I kind of just helped him out. And I wouldn't have even personally considered it caregiving. I just thought I was helping out my grandpa. Um, and then after time, I started to help him just initially with showers and things like that. And as I became busy with school and everything else, it just wasn't. I, someone needed to be there more often and he started to open up to it because he realized how busy I was. Um, but I just looked at it as caregiving. I didn't, or not caregiving, I'm sorry. I just looked at it as helping my grandpa. I really didn't think of it as much more than that or as a big deal. Um, but since then he has now allowed us to have caregivers in his home and now he has 24 hour care, um, which is probably more than he needs. But at the same time, he, he likes to push the envelope a little bit. He still thinks he can go work in the garden and, you know, drive himself everywhere. And unfortunately it's just not the case, but having caregivers there has definitely helped the rest of the family. Um, just be able to still live our life, but also know that he's safe. Um, it just, it's made a world of difference for all of us. Um, and even though we're, like I said, in the business of helping people out in their homes, it's, it's really nice to be able to see it from both sides of the spectrum and be able to see how much what we do helps people. That makes Matt, sense. and I, oh, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say, I, I like how Matt talked about how like he didn't think at all that he was a caregiver. He just kind of jumped in and helped. And I think sometimes millennials feel so isolated as caregivers uh, because they don't think that others out there are providing care. But when you start um, to talk to other millennials and talk about you know, even, you know, being a long distance caregiver for your loved one, uh, several states away, helping to coordinate their care, it is caregiving. And so I think so many millennials feel isolated in that role. But um, if they if they look out there, um, there are others that are going through this. And, and I think that there's um, some organizations that have done a good job to start to try to uplift the millennial caregiving story so that others know uh, that they're not alone. So um, Clarity for Charity, I think they go by 
HFC, just the abbreviation now, uh, they're an organization started by Lauren Rogan, Miller Rogan and her husband, Seth Rogan, the actor. Uh, and Lauren was going through Alzheimer's caregiving as a millennial herself uh, and found that it was really challenging to find a support group with people her own age. And so their foundation now has online support groups, ways to connect, uh, and they also have grant programs for respite care because uh, they, they were able to hire professional care to come in, but they know that so many people can't uh, afford that. So they want to provide that opportunity for those millennial caregivers to get a break because, um, you know, as a millennial, you kind of just want a day as an average, uh, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 something, uh, depending on, on if you're a, a younger millennial or older millennial. But um, I think that that's one great organization, and, and their website is wearehfc.org. So uh, if you're a millennial caregiver and you think, you know, I'm in it alone, I feel so isolated, that is a great organization. I love their resources, and they make it fun. Uh, they put some humor behind it, which, you know, we know that there are a lot of emotions for caregiving, uh, but sometimes you just have to laugh to lighten the mood and to get through it day by day. Well, that was one of the questions I was going to ask my support group is through the Alzheimer's Association and I don't know the demographics age wise of my town. I would think it skews older because we have a lot of retirement neighborhoods and um, two retirement assisted living communities and a third one is being built. So skewing older is probably a safe bet, but there are, I am frequently the youngest person in the group. And I'm 53 and I started, it'll be three years in November. So I was 50 when I started and it was kind of like a little bit odd because it was like, well, I won the lottery. I've been doing this longer than everybody here and I'm the youngest person here. <laughs> so I can kind of relate a little bit to not feeling like I was amongst peers. I mean, there's a gal in my support group that worked with my husband and she's in her eighties. So it's like, okay, you know, it's like, these people are all like my parents age and my dad's gone. And my, at the time my mom was, you know, in the memory care. So it was, you know, it was the support group is definitely something people should do. And I've heard of hilarity for charity. I have not checked it out. So I'm definitely going to do that when we're done because now I have even more reasons to do it. Um, I'm still attending my support group, even though now we're doing them, we're doing them in Google Hangouts for now, which is kind of funny because <laughs> Technology can be a little bit of a challenge for some of those, you know, baby boomers and um, I guess, I don't know, 46, my, my mom was born in 43, so I'm guessing the gal that's in her 80s is not even a boomer, so she's even older than that. <laughs> insane. Um, there was a question I was going to ask, well, I was, I was thinking, like, how do we help millennials identify as caregivers so that they realize that there are a lot of resources out there to help with the ice. You know, there's just a ton of resources. I didn't know about most of them until I joined my support group. So I kind of, I lean that way as in how do we help people realize that there's just this giant fast array of support tools just waiting for you to grab them. <laughs> Well, I think one of the cool ways too is actually what Lakeland does with your Facebook Live um, Alzheimer's group discussions that you hold for family caregivers. I think um, that will actually help out a lot of millennials. That's at least how they'll get aware that there are some resources is doing it through platforms that millennials actually use. So millennials use Facebook. <laughs> Somewhat. I'm not a millennial and I don't use Facebook terribly. I use it for the business and that's about it. <laughs> Yeah, I do think, you know, social media is one way that organizations like Clarity for Charity are really reaching those millennial caregivers. And, you know, I do work in the space and I share out a lot of content on social media. And it is surprising the people that reach out to me that I didn't know were caregiving. Uh, I have a friend who he has parents in India and he's long distance caregiving for them and reached out to me for, you know, just resources and support. And uh, I think sometimes they might not think uh, to go to their area agency on aging because they probably don't even know that that exists. So um, I think, 
you know, as a millennial in this space, I work really hard to educate my peer group. I just spoke at our local young professionals summit. I was shocked that they accepted my proposal to talk about aging at their summit, but I thought it was really progressive because uh, I had a, like a room full of a hundred people and afterwards people were coming up and saying, oh yeah, I actually, um, am caring for a loved one or my mom is and I, I want to get her connected. So I think, you know, some of it has to be a grassroots effort, um, but there are so many great resources out there that exist and, um, you know, whether it's, you know, connecting them to, to their local area agencies on aging or Alzheimer's Association or Hilarity for Charity or, um, you know, even just offering to be a uh, a support system for your friend or relative is so important. I think uh, when we think about caregiving in general, it's important to have that support system. Uh, and so, you know, as a fellow millennial, you can offer to to help out. And maybe it's, you know, taking your friend's kids to school uh, if they're trying to juggle that. Or, um, you know, if it's your peer, your coworker at work, you know, maybe you offer to get cross-trained on some of their projects. So if they have to drop everything, and take their loved one to the hospital, you know, you can kind of jump in and support them. So uh, I think that that is, you know, the way we're going to get through it all. Um, and I think one neat thing that Home Instead has developed recently, it's this program called Ready to Care. And it's just a social movement we're trying to start, where we're, we're trying to get everyone to think about how can I care for others in my community, whether it's my elderly neighbor or my aunt who's a caregiver, just little things we can do for them throughout the day uh, and just to be a little more mindful uh, on how we can support each other. Because I'm sure, Jennifer, as you look at the numbers of, of the age wave and of people, uh, the growing number of people developing Alzheimer's and dementia, it's going to take us all. I think it's going to be go back to that it takes a village uh, kind of mentality to to support caregivers. So those are just a few of the thoughts that I have around that. I love that ready to care because one of the, one of my goals with the podcast and what I was going to do in 2020 was start speaking engagements. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to the dogs. That's about all I get to do at this point <laughs> um, was to, you know, to let people know you got to have conversations with your loved ones. You know, my dad was on hospice and his best friend, who was originally the trustee of their estate, there was a whole giant problem. <laughs> and he looked at me and he goes, well, your dad just here, he assumes that your mom will come live with you. And it was all I could do not to just drop some pretty, uh, you know, inappropriate words. My daughter moved out February 1st, 2017. My dad died March 2nd, 2017. And I was mm -hmm. 50. Like, hell no. <laughs> no, 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 no. You know, it's like, like I said, before we started recording, we had a huge single story house. And out, even after caring for her in the memory care residence, I recognized lots of problems in a house that was supposed to be our forever home. I mean, it had one level of floor. It had tile and carpet, which would have thrown her off because her visual processing was just shot and so the transition from the beige tile to the beige carpet would have you know the the difference in the feel would have like panicked her our our gas range if you leaned against the stove in the kitchen you're just chatting you could lean against the knobs and flip on the gas like um, the next thing you know there's flames on the stove and it's like whoa okay you know and obviously for those of us that don't have cognitive issues it's you know, it's like a duh, don't lean against the stove, but, and, and turn it off. And then we backed up to open space that, you know, she may or may not have gone into. I don't know. It's just, it's like, there were so many things that I didn't even think about. But one thing I knew was I'm like, we would like to travel, you know, hmm, the before times and, <laughs> you know, we still work and I'm like, no. You know, there was no conversation about what would happen if he died first, which was stupid. He was also diabetic. He had heart issues. I mean, he definitely was likely to go first. And we never talked about what we would do with my mom. I had to find out kind of in an ugly way what was expected. And that's kind of like a, a pivot point right there. I, I'm noticing that older people, maybe it's, you know, the younger boomers and the older Gen Xers, although those people aren't that old yet, 
Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm close to the, the, I was born in 66. So I'm on the, on the older end of Gen X, but it's like, like Matt's dad, he, or grandfather, he's realizing that having people in your home and taking care of you is not this horribly, horribly intrusive, you know, privacy violating, you know, thing. And cause like I have a grandmother that's 102. She's mostly blind from glaucoma and now she's profoundly hard of hearing and it makes taking care of her very difficult. She refuses to consider an assisted living that I know she would love because she would have people at her beck and call. She wouldn't have worries. Um, I think my aunt's got caregivers from like my aunt's church that come in and help, but sometimes they don't show up and that's really frustrating and it's just, you know, my grandmother at 102, so I don't even know what generation that one is, she <laughs> expects family to do. She has lots of money, but she will not do Meals on Wheels, even though way back, you know, many years ago, my dad recommended it. And she's like, well, that's charity. And he goes, no, you could actually pay for it. And I suggested that because she's got plenty of money, that she pay for her meals and more it's really inexpensive so and i don't know what the number actually is but if it's ten dollars a week she could have easily afforded 40 and then help three other seniors i thought that would appeal to her nope it was like <laughs> family helps family and that's it and i'm noticing that that's starting to change which is important yeah. because you know like for me i was still working my sister's four and a half years younger she still has school age kids so She's a sandwich generation. You guys are younger and you know, you're just trying to start your adult lives or, you know, progress into the next phase of your adult lives. You know, you can't just put everything on hold and take care of a family member until they pass away. So I'm hoping that's all starting to change. You know, I don't know. Do you guys, do you guys see any of that changing? Oh yeah. So one of the things that I do here is on a client's first shift, um, I will introduce the caregiver to that senior. So I will go over and do the introduction, help walk them through the house, um, you know, stay for a good half hour to an hour, just make sure that it's not awkward and that it's a good fit and, you know, things like that. But um, you would be shocked at how many families don't tell their loved one before I get there with the caregiver that oh, we're coming to help take care of them. Like usually the family will be there at least to break the news, but yeah, I've been a part of quite a lot of uh, awkward conversations to say the <laughs> least. It, I'm um, laughing, but oh, geez, that's... It I, happens I, way more often than you think, too. I, well, I think part of it is, you know, like if you told my mom something, like literally one or two minutes later, she wouldn't remember. So it was pointless to tell her something ahead of time. And even somebody who is not as advanced as she was in al Alzheimer's or dementia, you know, that's a difficult... See, that goes back to you got to have these conversations way early on. and. You know, I'm actually, the episode that came out today is on, you know, your golden years and end of life conversations. And that sounds really ugly, end of life, but it's like, well, we all, we all are going to have one of those eventually. Um, some of us sooner than later, like my grandmother's 102 and my parents died in their late seventies. So you never know when it's going to happen and it benefits everybody if you have a conversation first. So that's why I'm laughing about the, <laughs> the awkward conversations that poor Matthew has to be part of. <laughs> Have you been part of any battles? <laughs> yes. Um, they're usually, though, because the family will give them an ultimatum. And it's usually, it's actually funny because the Alzheimer's patients are usually the easier ones. It's the people that are more fall risk or things like that, that don't want anyone in their home that really get offended by it. Um, yeah, it's usually the people that have any issue with activities of daily living, performing them by themselves. Those are the people that... <laughs> fight it more. Um, the family <laughs> usually then says, okay, it's either this or assisted living and that's it. And then they usually choose, you know, home care um, for the most part. So, but unfortunately, yes, they, um, they kind of depends on the case, but we've had to say different things for different clients just to, you know, help the family and help them get to that point where they do accept the caregiving. Yeah. My dad, he was in the hospital for a month he was, as I said, he was diabetic. He had a donated kidney that was failing because he was a terrible diabetic and he ate what he wanted because he thought that, you know, I'm going to eat what I want and die happy is what he said, which trust me did not work. 
It did not happen. And he did not want to go back on dialysis, which I was completely understanding, accepting. What I don't accept, and it's been more than three years since he passed, was the fact that he didn't tell any of us that he should have been on dialysis. So my husband, my daughter, and I show up. My husband showed up first. We to um, It was the Tuesday after Thanksgiving. We were going to put visit, put up Christmas decorations for the two of them. And my husband walks in and my dad said, well, so how's the credit union business treating you? My husband's like, um, I haven't been in the credit union business in 13 years. What the hell is going on? So his memory went back to like 1998. And had I known what was going on, I would have hopefully called hospice right then and there. Although it was such a stressful, you know, and this is where conversations are important. Because I did not know what was going on. We forced him to the doctor, to the hospital. He was in the hospital for a month, 32 days. The kidney, his personal kidney doctor kept saying, well, you know, once we do a few rounds of dialysis, his memory should return and blah, 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 blah. And it never did. He did know that he had a gap in his memory. So he, he knew that it was like, like he'd been in a coma or something. And he knew that it's 2016, 17 and I think it's like 1998. And he was anxious to fill that. But after three days, you know, that clarity disappeared, which I thought was kind of interesting. And then he fell and he ended up at a different hospital system. And they called me and said, you know, basically well, they were doing dialysis, which I know he didn't want, but they didn't really give you an option. And his heart rate would drop dramatic, just dangerously low. And this doctor spent 20 minutes telling, giving me all of the rundown. And I finally said, we're in an extremely dark gray area of violating his advanced directive. And that lady pivoted right into hospice talk. Like I didn't have to, I thought I was going to have to argue with them. And we just immediately went into hospice talk. But holy Toledo, that man fought with those in-home caregivers. <laughs> <laughs> he was a pain in the butt. <laughs> And some of them were really good. One of them was a nurse and she did the in-home caregiving kind of on the side. She was fantastic. We had like some really fantastic ones. The overnight ones were, eh, you know, we kind of had a little bit of a mixed bag, but you know, in the end it worked out really well. And unfortunately the gal that was probably the least effective is the one that got to deal with my dad dying at night. <laughs> I think he died and she came on shift like, right. It was like, boom, boom. I was like, nothing. I'm assuming you would expect that, but oh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not how I would want to start my work shift. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm for, totally familiar with somebody who's, he thought his mind was fine. He did not understand that it was not 1998. And he literally would not let the caregivers help him any more than absolutely necessary. And it was it was a struggle up until the very last week. So I can I can I can sympathize with you there, Matthew. <laughs> what I always taught my caregivers was the redirect tactic. So let's say you knew what his past profession was before you went in the home or anything. The move that I always use is ask them something about their past, not in the last ten years. Um, usually just to help get the conversation going. And then once they start talking to you about their past, they kind of start to trust you, and then it's usually kind of helps prevent the awkwardness and like the just to ease those weird those few tense moments when they realize they're forgetting something and the wheels start spinning and they start getting frustrated themselves um it's just it's just what's helped me the best um yeah that's what i always tell people though the redirect is usually the one that kind of will help gain you their trust the fastest i think asking about a past profession too with men is really effective <laughs> That wouldn't have worked as well with my mom, <laughs> especially at the end. She was start, She started to talk about her. She remembered her brothers, but not her sister, which was kind of sad. And she thought I was her best friend. So it would, conversations with her were very, <laughs> very fun. <laughs> they were a big challenge. So I know, and I have to put on my glasses because for whatever reason, this side of the page is smaller print than the rest of it. Um, so millennials face economic challenges that no other generation has faced. I know that for a fact since my daughter's 20, almost 29. And then of course, family caregivers also face significant financial challenges. So what kind of things do you think maybe we should be thinking of as a collective citizenry? Ooh, I got that word out correctly. 
you know, I mean, we're, we're talking about stimulus packages and unemployment packages and our, you know, we're talking about the economy again. You know, I thought we were kind of over that for a little while, <laughs> you know, so I am very much, I, I believe that we need to start with the most vulnerable and work our way up. And our government seems to think if we start with the giant corporations, it'll work its way down. They haven't figured out that doesn't work very well. So what kind of things should people like us be talking about and maybe advocating for as we face yet another economic crisis in our country? Because I just can't imagine what some of these family caregivers are going through with, you know, what's going on. And then I know here in California, despite the fact that our governor's father passed away from Alzheimer's right before his inauguration, he is trying to strip um, the adult day programs, the ones that are run like by the Veterans Association. I don't think they're run by the Veterans Association, but they affect family caregivers of people that were veterans. So like the gal I told you that my, my worked with my husband, she goes, her husband attends a program through his veterans benefits. And they're trying to like, basically just like wipe the slate. Like, Oh, we're not going to support that anymore. And I'm kind of all for more money for the younger people because there's a lot more life ahead of them, hopefully barring anything horrible. And I don't want to take away money from seniors, but it's like, if there's only so much that we have, then, you know, I, I usually lean towards like children and education and all that. But on this one, it was like, absolutely not. You're not taking money out of that program because these family caregivers need that desperately for many, many, many reasons. And I'm an advocate, a policy advocate with the Alzheimer's Association. So I sent out lots of tweets and phone calls and all that stuff because it's like, no, no, you're not, mm -mm, we're not ending that program. But it's like, California is like billions of dollars in the red now because of this, you know, pandemic. So it's like, we can't just print the money. So I don't, I've, I've had some of these conversations with family caregivers and they're kind of in the same boat as I am. It's like, you know, the schools need it because we need to prepare for our future, but we can't just leave family caregivers hanging and not take care of seniors and yikes, what a mess. So you have any you opinions know, on that one? <laughs> well, I think that right now the time that we're in is, is, is unique for so many reasons. You know, COVID has really, I think, shown a light on family caregivers. Uh, a lot of their worlds have been flipped upside down. A lot of supportive services have been temporarily closed or suspended because of COVID. And, um, you know, family caregivers who once were maybe able to drop their loved one at adult day and go to work, and they might not have that. They might be working from home and trying to, um, you know, engage their loved one in an activity on the side while they're on a Zoom call. Uh, so really, they are, um, you know, facing even greater challenges now than I think they were pre-COVID. Uh, and I think that there's so much work that can be done to support caregivers. There's some great caregiver advocacy groups. I know the Alzheimer's Association is one of them that's advocating tirelessly for those impacted by Alzheimer's disease. I sit on the board of directors for the National Alliance for Caregiving, uh, and that's another great organization that takes on those really important caregiving issues like FMLA and, and those types of things. I know at Home and Said, we have a whole policy uh, team that uh, recently introduced a bill like, can we use our HSA dollars to pay for some of these caregiving services? Uh, so, you know, maybe it is a tax credit. Maybe it's using those HSA dollars. Maybe it's increased funding for things like Meals on Wheels programs or adult days. Uh, there's a lot of things I think that could help, uh, but I think the uh, our society needs to value caregivers and what they contribute. Because if you equate caregiving, I, I don't have the stats right in front of me, but they, they're out there somewhere. If you took every family caregiver and add, added up all the hours of basically free care they provide their loved ones and put a dollar amount to it, it's in the trillions of dollars. So if that were to all fall on our economy, we would be in a whole new world of hurt on top of all this. So this is I, very true. And that's current numbers. And, you know, as the boomers get older and, and the Gen Xers, I know there's not as many of us, as we get older, you know, they're, 
anticipating in 30 years that the number of people living with Alzheimer's will double from right now, which is a horrifying statistic in my world. And I'm hoping we don't get there. And I saw a number, it's like, it's not, it's, it's more than half by 2030, which is only not quite 10 years. So it's like, yikes, you know, the, the progression is huge. And if people think COVID-19 has cost us a lot of money, it's nothing compared to what Alzheimer's and dementia and, and other, you know, cognitive impairment diseases are going to cost the world. It's just yeah. insane. Yeah. And I think, you know, it'll probably have to come back to that. You know, it takes a village mentality. We're all going to have to chip in because it, you know, caregiving is a financial burden or uh, creates a financial strain and burden for many people. Um, and, you know, we're, we're all going to have to come together and, um, you know, from private sector to public sector uh, and, and really come together in nonprofit to support these family caregivers because, um, you know, caregiving is not going away. It's only going to grow as you just talked about those numbers. Um, and so we really, we all do need to come together. That's, I think, one of the reasons I just love that ready to care program is, you know, just every, helping to make it more top of mind for people. Um, just what are the things you can do every day to help in your community locally? Um, and, and hopefully that will be that grassroots effort that really helps to make a big difference. Yeah, definitely. Cause I think unless you've dealt with it or know somebody who's dealt with caregiving, you have no clue. Cause it seems very hidden. Um, mm -hmm. I find very interesting and maybe it's just because we're running around, bustling around, busy with our lives that we don't realize that, you know, oh, we haven't seen our neighbor for a while because she's taking care of her husband or, you know, we haven't seen Matthew because he's helping take care of his grandfather. And I wonder how that's going. And I wonder if he still plays on the softball team or whatever you do, <laughs> you know, and it's like you think about it, but then you go off and do the 500 things that you have to do this week. So I do think that I, I love the term, it takes a village. And I did have, oh, it was um, way back in the first year of podcasting, I interviewed the gal that um, ran our adult day program that also incorporated the kids from the preschool. Oh, I love and, that. Oh, it was it's such a great program because when she was talking, the you could see the benefit the seniors were getting, that was obvious. And you can see the benefit that the school age kids were getting because in, in the morning it would be like the preschool or kindergartners. And in the afternoon it would be more of the school age elementary school, fourth and fifth graders. And you could like hear between the lines, which I know is really a weird statement, how the, like the parents, how the sandwich generation person was benefiting, like the person that wasn't even there, you know, the kids get a little extra tutoring or they get a little like grandparent type of time. And, you know, the seniors are getting the stimulation from the children. And, you know, like my mom loved to watch kids. So, you know, she would have loved that kind of program. And like, if it was my sister taking my mom, you know, you could see how my sister would benefit because mom would be happier and the kids would be happier. And, you know, my sister wouldn't have even had to have gone to the program. She just would have benefited from it. And so I did call it that episode is called it takes a village and i i truly feel like you know we need to we need to realize what's going on out there so that we can take care of each other you know we can like my husband was delivering meals on wheels this morning it's something he's doing every week because the meeting he had on tuesday mornings is not mean not happening because of the virus but it's something he's going to continue doing even after the meetings resume whenever the hell that is i don't know 2025 maybe <laughs> it's like beginning to feel like never and, you know, because he just, he just, it just really brightens his day to help these seniors and, you know, and it, and it brightens their day, you know, side note, our Rotary Club has a program called um, Rotary Home Team where volunteers from the local Rotary Clubs go into seniors home and do light home maintenance, which of course... Great. Um, is a fantastic program that is also on hold because, you know, you don't want a bunch of strangers going in and out of different people's homes. So, you know, there's just a lot of things that we can do that don't require a lot of time or a lot of money. Um, they always say with the Rotary Home Team, like, you don't know how, you don't know how, let's see, obviously I don't know how to speak. <laughs> you don't have to know how to use tools. 
you can sit and talk to the senior because sometimes that's one of the most important things. It's like, you, know, you might have a light bulb that's 20 feet up in the air, which is a pain in the butt for those of us that are physically, you know, able to get a ladder and get up there and change the light bulb. But, you know, just sitting there and having a conversation with them. So that's what a lot, you know, like a lot of the ladies will go and do the home team and they'll just sit there and chat and, you know, sometimes they'll help clean up the kitchen and do stuff like that. And, you know, it really does take a village and I'm hoping that people start realizing that maybe that'll be a bit of, you know, a side benefit of this um, pandemic that we're living through is we're going to realize that uh, we have to really like step it up here and kind of be better humans to each other. I think a lot of people too, because of this virus, you know, their big game plan was assisted living of some version. And I think that's changing for a lot of families now. So I think to go back to your episode today about having that conversation now becomes even more important than it ever was. Yeah. That, that, that guest of mine um, is in, he's like a nursing home provider, care provider kind of person. So like one step different than you guys. And I know a lot of people have been talking about like, well, do I take my mom out of the memory care and bring her home? You know, Mm -hmm. some people are like, I'm about ready to kill my parent. Do I put them in the memory care? And even though I might not be able to see them or, you know, they might run a risk of, of developing the disease. My mom's residence had no COVID the last time I was there cleaning out her room. I haven't checked in recently, but I mean, they literally kicked this out mid March. So and then we saw them, that was in like mid-May. So two months later, they had not had any virus in the residence. And they had had a huge flu outbreak in the assisted living half of the community. It was so bad. They had to basically like shut down the dining room. They were delivering meals to all the residents' apartments. And it affected the memory care because there were certain things they couldn't do with the memory care residents. It was like, ugh. So I think they had kind of a preview on how to handle it. But, you know, I know the the paid caregivers that are there are struggling because family members like me are not going in and like taking my mom to the park or taking my mom out or just spending time with her. And, and they don't get to talk to like normal people for lack of a better term. And it's, it's a huge challenge. And I don't know how I would handle it. If I, I mean, I couldn't see my mom for two weeks and it was starting to get problematic because I was very concerned that she would completely forget me and then not trust me. Um, I really didn't have a problem with being her best friend that she'd known forever. <laughs> so I've known her for years and years. I'm like, yeah, no kidding, my whole life. <laughs> and, um, you know, that, that did not, you know, that didn't cause me any like angst or anything. But I was super concerned that since she was already combative, that she would forget me, which seemed logical. And that she would just she would just be a terror you know like why are you here bugging me why are you taking me in this car you're just like oh i just had nightmares so i was i was like the quarantine queen the husband went to the grocery store i stayed home kind of easy in march nasty weather wet cold probably not like you guys but (laughs) it's nasty for northern california anyway and i got to the point where it's like okay it's been 10 days i think i'm about ready to call the executive director and basically tell him i'm coming in you know, she's bed bound because her leg is broken. She can't put weight on it. And she was like two doors over from the second door over from the hallway where there was a back door. I was like, I'll, you can let me in the back door and I'll just right into her room. I was like, I had it all planned out. I was storming the gates. But she <laughs> fixed that for me. So, <laughs> and they yeah. were really good because they did let us come in and see her before she passed away. And 10 of us ended up there outside her room the day she did pass away. The poor executive director was like, uh, leave, go away. <laughs> Too many of you here. I mean, it's funny, but it's like, it's just uh, such a strange situation. And I don't know how I would have handled it if she was still alive and she hadn't broken her leg and we couldn't go to the park and I couldn't see her. I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. Don't family. Know. My heart just goes out to those families that are in similar situations to yours, Jennifer, and, you know, not being able to see their loved ones and, you know, those who have loved ones with 
memory issues or uh, cognitive impairment, um, that, that fear of them forgetting uh, who you are, um, it's, it's, it's real. And I'm sure, you know, many millennials are also in this situation of, uh, you know, limited contact with their loved ones. And, uh, you know, they're also social distancing. And so it's just, I think it impacts, you know, all the generations, no matter if you're a caregiver as a millennial or if uh, just a caregiver in general, even if you're caring for your loved one at home, again, those support systems might not be there, uh, the ones that you counted on. So, um, you know, we're in kind of unprecedented times and, um, you know, Matt made a great comment earlier about it's a great time to, to plan ahead and to make almost like a plan A, B, and C because you never know these days. Uh, and, and really ask, you know, what are your loved one's wishes and, and research what, what's out there for services in the home and what's out there for assisted livings and, and skilled facilities and memory care. Uh, because sometimes, you know, Jennifer, you mentioned it, it was in your family, there was like a crisis situation and you had to make decisions all of a sudden and uh, you don't have the luxury of time always to research. So the more you can research ahead of time, the better off uh, hopefully the situation will be or at least a little less stressful because you're not having to make as many decisions because you've talked about it ahead of time. Well, it's fun to uh, pick hospice, in-home caregiving, and then a memory care residence basically flying by the seat of your pants Wow. Where we lived, there was a memory care residence literally a mile down the hill from my house. And I knew mom wasn't going there. And then the other um, assisted living community that's here in town does not have memory care. So we had to go one more town over. She was she's mm. like 15 minutes away. It was not a problem. But I walked in. I felt comfortable. And, and then they said she could keep her dog. And it was like, here's money. Take it. <laughs> you know, it was like I didn't care. You know, I didn't. I didn't do any of the research that you know. I think back on them like I didn't check in with, you know, like the health department or I don't even know where all I should have checked in. But I didn't even go on Google. You know, it's just <laughs> like I didn't go to Yelp. I didn't do any of that logical stuff because it's just it was like, you know, I just I did not have a lot of time and you know, my dad had just passed away and it was just, it was just, just way too much. So, you know, when you say you should have a plan A, B, and C, and it's like, you know, have a plan. Like, ideally, this is what I'd really like. But if mm -hmm. that doesn't end up being workable for whatever reason, because stuff changes, we all know that, then here's an alternative. And if that alternative doesn't work, then maybe we should think of like, I don't know, throw me on a boat and push me out to the ocean. <laughs> um, but yeah, because it's like, it's just crazy. I was on Instagram the other day and this gal, it was kind of like a, because it's Instagram, she couldn't really at the person, but she basically, this post was directed towards their governor in Oregon about rules for family members of somebody living in a memory care residence. And I thought her suggestions were fantastic. And she said there was like a smoking area just outside the memory care residence, but nobody used it because nobody was smoking good for that one but they would not allow her they would not bring her mom out and like sit there because she they, she said that they would be cited and I'm like okay my maternal grandfather always said you don't get out of this life alive and I told her I'm like I'm all for being cautious but that's leaning into the paranoia I'm like something's gonna happen I mean my mom fell and broke her leg and died within you know two and a half weeks that was I mean, I don't think it was avoidable because she was combative and it just, it's, it's what happens. You know, it's like, I thought she'd live a lot longer. So it was, it was quite a surprise that she, she left us, but it's like, I think the isolation is so much worse and her suggestions were so good. I should, I'm going to repost them and maybe we can all start a movement on here's some really good rules. It was like the family caregivers had to like wear a mask and maybe gloves. They had to make an appointment they had to be escorted right to the family member's room. They could be there for half an hour to allow for other family members to have their appointed visit time. I mean, it, it didn't sound super pleasant, but it was better than not being able to see them at all. So, you know, I yeah, guess. I think, yeah, these living communities, they just have such a challenge uh, of trying to make everyone happy and follow the guidelines. I, I interviewed um, someone from that works in a memory care facility recently. 
I did a COVID caregiving during COVID Facebook live series. Uh, and I just asked him, you know, talk us through from your side, your perspective as working in a facility. Uh, and he brought up some really great points. So it is hard, you know, people that are working in this industry, you know, generally they are there because they, you know, they have a heart for what they do and for caring for others. And so having to say no to family members coming into a facility can't be easy for them. And, and it's got to be so hard to be that family member sitting outside the door wanting to visit your loved one. My heart just gets pulled in all these directions, just thinking about how COVID is impacting, um, you know, really the whole industry of senior care and, and dementia care. Yeah, it's been, it's been a challenge. I've thought about, you know, like the what ifs and how should we's and, to the point where it's like, okay, I got to start thinking about something else because you know, your mind just spins and it's like, I'm not coming up with any really solid answers. So I was really impressed that this gal had thought it through. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think it was easier since she was in the situation. Like I said, my mom like removed the problem from our plates. And so I only think about it kind of in the abstract. But let me ask you, Matthew, have you had people that have not wanted the services because they're concerned or how is how is the concern over transmission of disease affecting like you guys i know we're kind of getting a little off topic but that's okay no it's a, i think it's a good question um i'll be honest i thought it was going to actually affect maybe our actual caregivers more than it would but we I am so proud of them. We didn't lose a single one because of the virus. We had a couple of people take a couple of weeks off, but we didn't lose a single one because they got either got sick or were scared. Um, so hats off to my caregivers. You guys are awesome. But our clients, we did lose a few, but not because of the virus. Um, the fear of the virus, yes, that was a huge one. We actually lost a big chunk of clients because of the initial fear. Um, we are slowly getting a lot of them back and we are very fortunate that we don't lose a single one directly due to the virus. But yeah, I think that initial just fear and no real answers really scared a lot of people. Um, <clears throat> yeah, just that no, there was no, there still really isn't any clarity, you know, or anything on the horizon of good news or just news in general to yeah, get people. News. So, yeah. So um, I think now that it's been a few months, we're definitely starting to see people come back, but yeah, that fear at the beginning, just whoo, that's like a big toll on yeah. just my ends. It even hit podcasters because March was my highest download month until this month, thankfully. Um, but you could see it was like, the numbers were going up, 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 and you could see the week where Gavin Newsom, governor of California, basically said, we're shutting down the seven counties of the San Francisco Bay Area, of which I am one. And it was like, oh, now it starts to drop off. And then when he shut down the whole state, then it was even further. It was like, whoop, it fell off the cliff. And then May was kind of, it was decent. It was kind of coming back. Um, and then June has been really good. So yeah, it's just been, it's just, it's hit everything it was it's like you know splattered everywhere and just affected everybody and you know i i could i get worried for your guys's generation because you know you, we first we had the financial crisis of you know 0809 my daughter graduated from high school in 9 and college in 14 so she you know entered her adult life under those circumstances and then you know like well you know 6 years later now we have this problem and it's like <laughs> you guys ever going to get out from behind the eight ball? I mean, I graduated from high school into a recession and I graduated from college into a recession. And, you know, I thought that was terrible at the time, but Holy Toledo is nothing compared to what's happened, you know, since the year, you know, 2008. It's just insane. And so I'm very, you know, I appreciate that we've had this conversation because I really, I really want to help all caregivers, but I really want to help like the younger generation identify themselves as caregivers so that they then they can obviously think oh maybe i should start looking for some resources and maybe they'll have conversations with their family members much earlier in the game and mm -hmm. that's my goal so you guys have any last minute suggestions for millennials family members of millennials any good stuff before we Matt, what about you um thanks um i guess really just don't try to do everything yourself. Um, you know, be a community. Like like Lakeland said, you know, it takes a village. You know, you need to have your 
caregiver network where it's other family members, just even if they're not in the state, like Lathan said, just have, don't try to do it alone. Um, and then try to take time for yourself. It's really hard to do. It's very hard to do when you're taking care of someone else. <laughs> Um, and then trying to mix in your career as well, but you have to, you have to find time for yourself to just, you know, cool down. Like don't burn yourself out with it because you're not going to help anybody then. So that was just, very true. I call it putting your team together and there are yeah. ways of, you know, like if you've got an out of state sibling, you know, they can make phone calls. They can talk to the insurance company because there's some things that I just, instantaneously get frustrated with talking to insurance companies, one of them. Like I could be on hold for 30 seconds and you could just see it's like, whoop, I'm at a 10 now. <laughs> it's just like not something I'm, I don't know, I'm not wired to deal with very well. My husband, he can be on hold for two hours and you know, he just does other things while he wanders around with his phone and waits for somebody to finally pick up the phone and deal with the problem or whatever's going on. And I just, I can't do that. You know, listening to him on hold for two hours makes me crazy. So there's options for people to help, um, even if they're not local. You know, and I've always stressed, and I learned this from another podcaster whose family just fell into doing it this way. And I, I think they should be, they should get a medal. I hold them up as a blueprint. You know, there, his grandfather said, I can't do this anymore. And basically told his children, find mom a care residence and they did and they all came together and they kind of said, well, I can do this and this person can do that. And they all kind of chose tasks and responsibilities that they were, they felt comfortable doing and they just did it. And his grandmother passed away. And about the time that his grandmother was at the end of her life, her younger sister who had not married or had children also ended up with Alzheimer's. So they just kind of enfolded some other cousins. They expanded their family caregiving. Um, oh, what did they call that? Shoot. Um, oh, heck. I, it was such a good t name. And uh, oh, their care committee. And they even talked about like filing like papers like a corporation so that everybody was covered and, and you know, like kind of put in a legal structure to what they were doing. It was really, really smart. So I, I second and third getting your team in place and do it early. You know, don't wait until you're like, you know, neck deep in the water going, holy Toledo, help me out. So do you have a last minute tip, Lakeland? I think Matt, that tip of getting your care team together is so important. And I would say also uh, connect with other caregivers. I think that that is another really important thing that you can do for yourself at any age. Uh, millennials, especially connecting with, with other caregivers who have gone before you uh, because there are so many tools and resources. You know, uh, I mentioned Hilarity for Charity. Uh, you can check out their website to connect with others in your age group. If you're a millennial caregiver I, at home and said, we have some great resources caregiverstress.com, helpforalzheimersfamilies.com, free websites uh, out there. And we also partner with Hilarity for Charity on a grant program for respite care. Uh, so also give yourself a break uh, as a caregiver. As Matt said, you know, you've got to take care of yourself to continue to take care of your loved ones. So whether it's asking a family member or a friend to step in while you, you know, go for a walk around the block or go, uh, you know, to your own health care appointment. Uh, because we see so often caregivers put themselves on the back burner and they end up sick. Uh, and, you know, as millennials, if we're not taking care of ourselves now in our uh, younger years, it's going to impact us later in life. There's so much research, this could be a podcast for another day, about how what you do in terms of your diet, exercise, sleep, now in our 20s, 30s, 40s, that will impact our own cognition later in life. So uh, we really uh, need to take care of ourselves. So uh, get connected, create your care team, uh, and don't be afraid to ask for help. Definitely don't be afraid to ask for help because everybody's with Alzheimer's, every person is different. So everybody with dementia or Alzheimer's is affected differently. And what worked for my mom might not work for, you know, Matt's grandfather it may not work for the gal who's taking care of her dad for my support group you know our support group because it's online right now basically they're all just chats we don't have speakers which normally we have speakers every other month 
and everybody is just out there throwing out a suggestion. It's like, well, have you tried this? Have you tried that? And sometimes it takes a little, you, know, you have to kind of just throw it out there like, well, I don't know if you've heard about this, but have you tried this? Or you've probably heard about it. You know, you, sometimes we kind of couch it in, you know, we don't want to be preachy or talking like, well, I know everything because nobody does. And it's just, it's definitely helpful. And that's why I started the podcast because I wanted people to be able to like download an episode that speaks to something that they're dealing with right now and they can listen while they do the 14 other things they have to take care of right now. And, you know, cause I, I was reading books and checking out websites and all that. And I thought, man, people who are taking care of their loved one at home, they don't have the kind of time for this research that I've put in. And I did not always get answers that solved the problems that I was having with my mom. So definitely reach out. It's, it's, that's, nobody's going to run away from you. And if they do, you don't need them. <laughs> I really appreciate that you guys both jumped online today, took time out of your busy schedules, you know, helping care for seniors to talk to me and my listeners. And I hope you guys have a good evening. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. It was such an honor, and we wish you a, late, a lovely evening as well. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.